Hello, everyone. Welcome to the binary episode of the Day Zero podcast. I'm Spectre with me as Z. Today, we have a series of blog posts on Pixel 6 bootloader exploitation, a white paper on benchmarking fuzzing um, using some bug injection, um, and some other hardware level type issues. Before that, though, we'll get into the Spot the Vuln solution. Uh, for those that were around yesterday, uh, you may recall I said this one was a bit of a weird challenge just because, uh, yeah, uh, it was a bit of an incomplete one that, uh, you know, got lost in the uh, chat history. So, yeah, um, but there is still definitely a solution to this one, and uh, I'll let's see you get into that. Yeah, there's still a solution here. Um, ultimately, you know, Spectre sent me his challenges, and... I, I don't get the solutions either, so I had to find it. I saw a solution here, and thus I ran with the ran with the code. So what we've got here, just a simple little to-do application, add to-do tasks, kind of the main function we're looking at here. And I did remove something like the null checks from all the allocations, mostly just to save space, but you can ignore that aspect. But technically, you could have null the references in here too. Um, key thing that happens here is you've got this body length, and if it's more than 1,024 bytes, which is what it expects, um, like initially as it allocates this block, it's going to do a realloc, so calculate body length minus 1.4, so just how many more bytes does it need, does the reallocation, uh, and then you just have this weird little mem set right after that. And that mem set just takes the size of and just adds on another 1,024 bytes. Uh, basically, it would seem like, you know, if this were, if I saw this in actual code, like somebody went and updated this calculation at some point to do that, but then didn't update the zeroing. Um, anyway, so the zero, because it's a fixed value there, effectively, you can have a case where the reallocation will, you know, only be like one byte or something. Um, and so this... Uh, I'm sad, we'll just go way out of bounds. You kind of, depending on how the allocator bucket set is going to depend on how far out of bounds you actually get in terms of like actually uh, out of bounds memory, but effectively 1024 bytes should be enough that the mem set is potentially writing out of bounds. It's just doing a zero write out of bounds, but still something exploitation of this would really depend on uh a lot more context and actually having something sensitive to do here. Realistically, most to-do apps probably aren't that interesting as an exploit target, but still a corruption to spot here. Yeah. Oh, um, um, and Bleeka mentions, yeah, the other thing, I meant to actually fix this in the code before I put this up, but uh, was that, yeah, the mem set also does it on the task object itself that gets allocated, which means it's also overwriting the title that was set earlier would be better to either do that afterwards or just mem set the body specifically um but yeah i mean technically you're losing it but it's a bug not a vulnerability just a bug i guess at least as far as we can tell from this code unless there's something that's going to assume there is a title and you can get some potential bones there i suppose yeah, but that is like out of the scope. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, basically like the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, basically what it was was I sent Z like a scratch pad of some of the challenges that I was working on for this bot the bone, and this was a challenge that I was trying to get something to work. I think I was actually going for more of a lifetime type issue, um, and I just didn't like the way it was going, so I just stopped working on it. But I left it in the like rough notes that I can see, <laughs> so. Yeah, that's kind of what happened there, but um, yeah, the mem set is definitely a valid issue, and we've set, we've seen like zero uh, or null out of bounds rights um, being taken to exploitation before. You kind of mentioned like a to do program probably wouldn't be too interesting. Um, that could be true, but it could also be like you could also get some control of the heap. Um, the task to do struct and specifically doesn't really have anything useful. It's just like a container for user data. It doesn't have any pointers or anything, but yeah. Um, in, in a lot of contexts, it probably would be exploitable in some way, shape, or form. So, um, yeah, it was a bit of an interesting challenge from a, from a history perspective and, and why there were a few different issues there. Um, and yeah, like the one Balika mentioned, like, yeah, that was just one that I never got to clean up because um, I didn't finish the challenge. But yeah, 
All right, so uh, we'll get into our topics. Uh, first one here is by Eshard and is the series of blog posts on Pixel 6 bootloader exploitation. Um, this is coming off the tail of the security advisory that was published by Google a few months ago, where a bootloader bug was reported and fixed in Android 13, and the bootloader update blew a fuse for anti-rollback because of it. Um, there was a little bit of, not too much, but there was a little bit of drama around that. Um, I think there are some people out there who didn't even know that, like, uh, this kind of anti-rollback would exist on Android. Um, and it kind of sucks, right? Because if you update to 13, then you're not going to be able to go back to 12 or whatever, or like not going to be able to revert the bootloader at least. Um, so yeah, like Google only really does that in the security critical context. I don't know if many other phones uh, like do that anti-rollback in the same way, but the Pixel does at least. Um, and yeah, so this is a three-part blog series, looks at uh, bootloader exploitation through fastboot. Uh, part one gives some background and RE information. Part two talks about exploit primitives, and part three gets into getting shell code uh, code execution going. It's worth noting they don't talk about a particular vuln here, unfortunately. Um, it's sort of like a bring your own bug type situation where they talk about the background and they give you a hint at how you can find the bug um, in the first blog post with, you know, dipping between Android 12 and 13's bootloader image and whatnot, but they don't point it out specifically. I don't really know why, because it's a fixed issue. It seems like something that would be good to cover in the blog post, but they just decided not to do that. Um, and yeah, yeah they don't really go into the reasoning, unfortunately. It's kind of one of those things where I, I'm not a fan of how they handled it here. But yeah, they kind of mentioned they leave the reader with the task of actually, you know, diffing the commands and finding some vulnerabilities. Of, but they do walk through their entire process of, extracting the firmware, getting through, diffing everything. Um, they go through all of that and, you know, finding, like, the basically they patched it between Android 13 and 12 and just found what was changed to find their vulnerability. So they give you a very strong direction as to where you could do it if you wanted to, um, just without it actually being explicit. I, I feel like, you know, in a blog post, should include that information. Like, I don't know, it feels really weird to go this far but no further in a sense when it comes to providing a specific vulnerability especially as they get into the exploitation it would make a lot more sense if they were able to be more concrete with everything yeah so uh like you kind of touched on here um part one talks about the boot process um and about the security update and some of the diffing um, and Android's boot flow. So, you know, going from the primary bootloader, PBL, to BL1, BL2, and finally BL31, uh, which is responsible for the runtime services. BL31 should run in um, EL1. So for those not familiar with ARM uh, privilege level terminologies, you have like EL0 through to EL3. Um, and the higher, un unlike x86, the higher number, the more privileged. So EL3 is is most privileged. Um, so yeah, it shouldn't have access to like trust zone and whatnot. So your initial entry like won't be the most privileged, but could be used as a foothold. Um, they then talk about diffing and reversing the command handlers on the bootloader, kind of standard, just using strings to find the relevant functions and finding the load address and stuff. Um, they also talk about how there's some fast boot commands like upload and download where they're not exposed um, through the command line of fastboot, um, but they are like internal commands that are used. Um, so they actually modified fastboot to be able to access those lower level commands. Um, and yeah, I thought that was a bit of a neat part of it. Um, that's when they go into part two, uh, which talks about the like emulating the bootloader and doing some exploitation. Um, they talk a bit about ROP and some of the gadgets you could use. For example, um, the download and upload functionality I mentioned earlier. They talk about how you could use that for like a read write primitive um, and using it as like function level gadgets where by just modifying pointers and memory to the backing stores for those buffers, um, you can get arbitrary data to and from any region over USB. Although um, it sounded like, and maybe you'll have a different understanding here, that they indicate that for their write primitive, they have that download of command there, but it can't actually be called directly, yet they had to add their raw DL. Uh, function which they were then able to use. I didn't quite understand like what the point was there because if, if it's in the binary, they seem to have at this point like they're going for raw. They have control flow hijacking, so they should be able to send it to like a download command. But then they mention here that they can call it directly while they're talking about the read write primitive. 
but sound like they also introduce like the vulner not necessarily the vulnerability but the gadget that they're well using. they're it's sorry that's talking about on the pc side for fast boot so like the fast boot tool on you know linux or whatever won't allow you to call into the like send a download command um so that's talking on the PC side, not on the on the device side. I mean, they are talking about it here, though, right when they're talking about their read-write primitives as part of the ROP chain. Like, it's in the ROP section where they're saying, we can't call this directly. Now, you know, it may be that. I did feel like that was maybe a little bit unclear. And then, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's yeah, a I fair interpretation. Yeah, talking about but... the, ex, like, the PC side. When they're having in the middle of the ROP section, it sounds to me like for some reason they can't call the function. Yeah. Um, Balika mentioned uh, uh, BL1 runs on EL3 for sure. Yeah, I was talking about the like the BL31, like the later boot stages, um, and said, okay, usually starts in EL1, but not always. I, I've seen it running at EL3. Okay, so it seems like something that's not exactly standard, um, at least in like the pixel, though. Uh, it seems it, it runs in EL1. But uh, anyway, so yeah, they talk about, um, you know, getting a read-write primitive through ROP. Um, for debugging, that's where the emulation comes into play. Basically for that, they just use like Unicorn and Keystone and Capstone, kind of the, the trinity there, um, and use that to emulate some of the bootloader functions and test their exploit primitives and stuff. It's a little bit similar to what we talked about uh, in that DEF CON talk we covered two weeks ago on emulation-driven RE, um, for those of you that were with us for that. Um, it has some similarities there in how they approach this and, and debug their exploit. Just that way they didn't have to use a device and you know reset it every time. And um, their debugging was, was somewhat limited as well. So yeah, um, just using emulation to make it a bit easier for the exploit dev. Now at that point you have read-write in the bootloader, but not really easy shellcode execution. So part three is about getting code exec beyond ROP. Uh, and they sort of do that in two ways, both involving the page table entries, as you might expect, um, the first and easiest way is they just search the bootloader for the virtual memory space metadata and iterate that to find the page tables. Um, and then they iterate the page tables looking for one that has uh, write execute permissions, which um, it seems they did find, which I was curious about. Uh, seems a bit odd. I can't see why such a page would need to exist in the bootloader, at least at that stage. Um, but they were able to find a, a page that was both write writable and executable and, and kind of hijack it there. Um, the second and more reliable way they go about, though, is to just find the PTE that has the data you control, um, such as a download buffer, and just smash the PTE entry to set up this writable and executable. Um, that way, it's you know it's going to be a bit more reliable. You're not relying on some random page that that exists um, that might be used for something else or whatever. So yeah, from there, um, they mentioned some things you could do with this with hints from a Black Hat presentation. Uh, for example, you could spoof like the Android verified boot or AVB measurements, uh, like boot hashes, unlock status, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, there's a few cool things you could do with this. Again, though, they kind of leave that as an exercise to the readers, you know, to what exactly you would want to do or whatever. Um, so yeah, I think this was a pretty cool series of posts from a research perspective. Um, it does have some useful background information, especially if you're not familiar with the Android bootloader. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, there is quite a bit of information missing, um, including like what the actual vulnerability was. As far as I know, I did do some searching. I, I I couldn't really find anything on that. It seems even though it was patched a while ago, it just was not published. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure what the like hesitation is for people who know about it to like not talk about it. But um, yeah, unfortunately, it seems that vuln is still not published. So you no, know, if you're looking for something fun to do. You could do you could uh, do that and do a blog post on it and actually try exploiting the the vulnerability using the techniques mentioned here. Yeah, like as a series of posts, um, I feel like there were some times where they, uh, I guess, jumped around a bit. Like part one to part two felt like a shift where it's like finding the vuln and then all of a sudden it's just and now all about raw. So presumably they had to control flow X, uh, hijack, and that was like the early on vuln that they had, but. It felt like a little bit of a jump, but on a whole, like it's a very beginner friendly post. They go into a lot of background that a lot of posts would skip over or not really talk about. Like when it's talking about bin diffing, you know, it's going into a lot more of the tools they're using, a lot more about how specifically they're looking at stuff, um, which I appreciate. Like they include a lot of beginner friendly information within this. They miss on that vulnerability point, which I mean, for us is kind of a big deal because that's a lot of what we do on this podcast. But on a whole, like, 
the post, like the whole series of posts, is pretty solid. Yeah. Um, Kurt Exploit mentioned the bone could be the one mentioned in a black hat talk. Um, Google reimagined a phone. So they actually, in part three, they, they mentioned that talk for uh, s- some of the like impact of what you could do. From taking a quick look at the slides, I don't believe it would be the same issue, just because it seems like it's in like the uh, uh, the GPT stuff or whatever, which I think is a bit of a different area. I'm not 100% sure. I'm just going off of like a first glance at it. Um, but that's a good shout. Like that's something else to, to look at for sure. Um, so yeah, good, good shout. Maybe we'll add that in the show notes, but uh, yeah, not exactly sure what the volume is here, but there's some useful uh, exploitation information, um, some cool tricks you can take away. So yeah, overall good series of blog posts. Um, just sad that there's, there's no volume information. Um, current exploit mentioned ABL is not open source. Um, I am not a hundred percent sure on that. Um, like I know, L- like LK, like Little Kernel, yeah, like Little Kernel and stuff is open source, but I think it's like modified and it's not entirely open source, so you have to do a lot of reversing. Um, a- Android's a little weird when it comes to being open source. Um, there's some components that are, some components that aren't. I don't believe the bootloader is is fully open source, um, but I could be wrong on that. Because it's not really an area that I put a lot of time into, but it is interesting. Um, Balika would probably know a bit more about that. So yeah, um, did want to give it a shout out, but like I said, no particular vuln there. Um, getting into some topics we do have a vulnerability for, um, we have a technical advisory from NCC Group on some more NXP issues. Uh, this one being an SDP read disable fuse bypass, where you can read sensitive memory through the uh, serial download protocol or SDP. Um, even if SDP read disable, uh, the fuse is blown. Uh, yeah, so Z, I'll let you get into this one. Yeah, and this one, Spectre kind of gave away what's going on with it, but being able to read the information, even if they've technically disabled it. Now, reading it is, you're able to derive what the information would be. I, technically, it is reading, like, I can agree with that, but it's a timing attack, or like, it's a timing side channel, basically. Um, they're able to look the time of a check data operation. Uh, so you can just, using the, uh, what is it, data configuration, DCD thing, um, basically give it the check data operation. You could use the timing on that in order to determine if it basically read a 1 or a 0. It's effectively working at the bit level. Um, you can apply a mask and you kind of can figure out if all the bits were clear, set, um, or if any of the bits were clear or set. Um, but yeah, it ultimately just comes down to that timing attack in the check check data thing. Um, you'll see these always have this bimodal distribution there, letting them basically figure it out that way, but it's very slow. It's not a direct read, but it is fun to see the timing attacks kind of come up here. It is a hardware attack. This isn't like remote or anything. Um, Still, I mean, something fun. It, I think they read like, yeah, four kilobytes here took a minute and 20 seconds. So not exactly a speedy read. Um, and you are bound to get a degree of um, uh, just bit uh, errors in the bits that you're reading out there. So it's not a perfect thing, but you can read bit by bit effectively. Very slowly. Takes a lot of attempts to actually determine the the reads, but you're able to get it. Um, so, I don't know, I mean, calling it a bypass feels like you're able to read the information out, but you're not really bypassing the fuse, but you are going at it with the roundabout way. Uh, when I think of a bypass, I think of being able to do the thing that it's preventing, rather than side channel. Maybe that's just me, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it is effectively just a side channel. I appreciate seeing just reaching the same uh, effectively reaching the same functionality through an alter- alternative route. Um, you know, just finding It's one those... of those side door type issues. Yeah. I was going to say that. Yeah. Finding that side door entry to do the thing that was otherwise being blocked here in this case, and then needing the side channel to actually determine any of the information that comes out. Yeah. I will say I do have a bit of a soft spot for these like uh, timing attack type issues. It's just kind of a fun way of approaching it. Um, relying on like, you know, the weaknesses of a chip or, or 
um, a protocol to try to glean some information. It's just a cool way of doing it. Um, not a way that you, a lot of people like think of immediately. Um, they're cool to see. But, I mean, these hardware attacks are very kind of like, you know, just magic. Like you do this and you can magically read it in a sense. Um, timing yeah. attacks pretty easy to kind of understand. Takes a little bit longer or a little bit shorter, depending on what the result was. Um, but yeah, I mean, I agree. I, I do kind of have a soft spot for seeing this sort of issue. Um, they're definitely fun to see, even if it's, you know, a hardware attack rather than necessarily binary exploitation. Yeah, um, and the practicality is somewhat limited because, you know, it's cool to be able to get the information based on the time, but you are doing this one bit at a time. Um, it, you know, it's going to take a while to read a substantial amount of data this way, um, but you can still do it. And, you know, especially if you know roughly where some sensitive data is, um, you know, it, you don't have to read everything. So, yeah, it, it's a cool vulnerability. Um, practically speaking, this seems like one of those things where you'd be doing like a self attack um, or you, like, yeah, you'd be attacking your own device or a device that you have like access to. Um, yeah, you'd go it's for not something you're going to be able on. to do remotely or something. Yeah, like it would be a device in client hands, but presumably they wouldn't want the client to actually being in full, let's say, API keys or secret keys off of the device itself. That's why they're actually disabling the ability to read in the first place. Exactly. Um, and then you would use this to pull out like API keys or any sort of sensitive information. Could be anything. I mean, this is just uh, the underlying uh, device there. It's not an actual application, so... Um, the context will vary, but yeah, it's slow, but I mean, especially on a personal attack, like a minute to read four kilobytes, it's lengthy, but it's not absurd. It's not unreasonable. Yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, continuing on hardware attacks, our next post is on some car hacking, uh, which we don't really cover too often. And uh, yeah, it's a it's a hardware topic on bypassing read protection on the RH850 automotive MCUs via fault injection. So this one's kind of neat. Like I said, fault injection and hardware attacks also aren't something we really get to talk about too often. Um, so yeah, this RH850 MCU is used for cars. And in some cases, you can get modules with debug access still enabled, but that wasn't the case here. It also utilizes the specification of secure onboard communication, or SecOC, um, which is an authentication standard for the CAN bus. So the chip has read protected regions so that you can't easily just dump the ROM. Um, it does have a serial header, which you can use with the Renesas Flash programmer tool. Um, but if you try to connect with it, it'll say it's prohibited for the device um, because it, it's basically been disabled on the chip itself. So he hooked up a logic analyzer to reverse the protocol and the command structure. Um, and one of the first things it does is it'll try to set up the clock speed and baud rate and then synchronize it with the tool. Um, and if you try to send any other command um, before like doing the synchronization, it'll just fail um, saying it's like, you know, out of sync or whatever. Um, and, you know, because you have to send that command first, that's also where they gate uh, the authentication or the, the enable and disable. So yeah, it, only that sync command is like gated. Um, in practice, though, in normal circumstances, that doesn't really matter because where you have to sync before you can send other commands, you'd still need to be authenticated to send them. Unless you glitch the chip to skip that auth check or, or the programming enabled check, rather. This is where the fault injection comes into play. Um, specifically here, what they went with was voltage glitching, which is one of the more common and cheaper methods of fault injection, where you'll typically drop the voltage for some period of time uh, to try to like brown out the chip and make it skip an instruction or something like that. Um, now, when I say brief period of time, um, in this case, it was on the order of nanoseconds at like 100 nanoseconds or less. Um, so you would need like, you know, some external chip that's reasonably quick to be able to time that properly. Um, although you wouldn't, I don't think you need like an FPGA or something. I think he actually used a Raspberry Pi Pico here. But um, yeah, so the glitch target is the part where it checks if programming is, is enabled when receiving the sync command. He goes through some of the specifics of the glitch attack, um, looking through the data sheet and establishing parameters. One thing that's kind of interesting is since this is a car uh, like CPU, um, and you know, obviously there's a safety like security critical context, the chip actually has two CPU cores. Um, there's a main core and one that acts as a validator. And if one gets a different result than the other, the device will reset. Um, so in order to pull off this attack, he actually had to glitch both cores. 
and he talks about some of the other you know minor inconveniences that he had to overcome when dealing with this um for example he had to desolder the decoupling capacitors because part of the job of de like the, the entire point of decoupling capacitors is to smooth out the the voltage um so yeah he, he removed those so that the the glitch attack could you know be more successful or was more likely to hit um and it was driven by a Raspberry Pi Pico, since it seems like this MCU isn't like super, you know, super fast chip or anything, and the glitch parameters were somewhat loose. Um, and then he basically like brute forced the timing to figure out, you know, when to time the glitch attack to hit that off check. And after about a day or so, uh, he was able to get it to work and was able to dump the firmware. So yeah, pretty cool attack all around. Fairly straightforward as far as glitches go. It seems the parameters weren't too strict here, and since it was just the one off check. Um, they didn't have to do multiple glitches or anything, which if they would have had to have done multiple glitches, it would have made the attack significantly harder. Um, it also seems like there was no like hardware mitigation against glitching because, you know, there are some devices that have like, uh, you know, anti tamper protection or and stuff like that, where it'll blow something if you try to mess with the voltage or whatever but it seems like in this case there just wasn't anything preventing that so yeah i mean it's it's fairly standard as far as glitch attacks go but still i like glitch attacks and we haven't covered one in a while so i figured it'd be cool to talk about okay so this is outside of my wheelhouse as most of the you know hardware level stuff is but wouldn't having the two cpus isn't that kind of at least a degree of uh mitigation for the glitch attacks Obviously not effective here, but yeah, I guess that's a fair point. Um, the two CPUs, um, I don't know if that's exactly what they were put in place for. Um, no, like I feel but, like it's uh, more of like a software glitch that they were trying to prevent, but uh, or a software bug. But yeah, I mean that's a fair shout out, I guess. Um, the the fact that he had to glitch both cores instead of one did add a little bit of complexity to the attack. Um, but yeah, like. It didn't have like an anti tamper where it would like you know erase the chip or something if uh, if you tried to mess with it. That's kind of what I was thinking of more uh, on the hardware protections. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Valika mentions Pico can do four nanosecond glitch easily. That's what I did for the Xbox 360 glitching. Okay, cool. I didn't realize it could go quite down to that uh, like strict of time. Um, nanoseconds isn't you know super strict timing, but still. That's that's impressive. I didn't realize it it could do um, glitching to that level. Uh, and, uh, IBR. I, uh, I was just going to mention that. Yeah, IBR mentions and clarifies there. I think it's more software bugs, Cosmic Ray Biff flips and stuff that would try and protect themselves. Against that. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense because I mean, in this case with the glitching there, it's not not really that hard. Like a, if you were only glitching one CPU would protect, but it's not that hard to change that so yeah that makes a lot more sense thing about the cosmic ray especially in vehicles no if that's not that un or it's not that common sorry but it's it's uh common enough that it's something they have to be considerate of yeah so uh fairly straightforward glitch attack um and i, I do really like them they're they're fun to talk about um, and also for doing research in areas like automotive, it can be very useful. You know, obviously getting the firmware to, or like the ROM to analyze it is one of the first steps in, you know, doing research on these types of devices. So these types of glitch attacks can open the door to further research. So, um, yeah, it's got some cool aspects to it. Um, and it's fairly accessible for those that aren't super familiar with like glitching. Cause yeah, there's, there's no complex, uh, FPGA stuff going on or anything like that. Uh, if you've never seen some of the real-time OS stuff running on cars, pray it stays that way. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I'm not really into automotive. I have seen bits and pieces of it from friends who have done, like, automotive-focused ETFs and stuff. Um, and just, like, research some boards. But, yeah, it's it's an interesting area. Um, yeah, it's, it's fun to see some of the weaknesses of it and whatnot. But, yeah, it's not really an area I've done a lot of research into. All right, so uh, we'll get into our last topic, which is a research paper out of Usenix 2022 and is about fuzzing, um, particularly when it comes to benchmarking fuzzing, which is a topic we've touched on before. In fact, this paper references some of the papers we've covered before on this topic, such as Unifuzz. So yeah, it's a bit of a follow up to some of the other stuff we've talked about. Uh, Z, I'll, I'll let you get into some of the, the meat and potatoes, I guess, of the paper, and then we can, we can talk about it. Yeah, and in this case, 
you know, the, the title here, Fixed Reverter, Realistic Bug, Injection Methodology, and it gives away what's going on here. Their attempt is they're trying to revert fixes for CVEs as a way of injecting bugs so that they're realistic bugs um, as a way of benchmarking fuzzers to actually have some comparison over is this fuzzer better than another one? And that is a pretty valid issue is how do you compare fuzzers? If you just toss them on like how many new vones do they find or something? Well, they're, you're kind of hindered by the progress of time in general, like Testing earlier is always going to be better, so you test them all in the same state, but then there are unknown bugs, there are known bugs. You don't really have, like, any sort of ground truth. So there's been this research into, well, injecting bugs. That way you know here are the bugs that it should be able to find. And what they've kind of applied here at a high level is they'll do um, effectively source scanning static analysis to find three sorts of conditions um or conditionals they call you know conditional abort conditional exec and conditional assign um and it'll use those as kind of the signal for this is a bug that's being fixed and they can potentially revert it um and the names kind of give things away conditional abort is like if you're seeing code or you're seeing a patch that's adding in a condition check if the check fails or passes it returns early that would be an early abort so conditional abort, conditional exec being um, just adding constraints to prevent it um, going into a branch. Uh, the other one being conditional assignment, gain if it, like, say, fixes up a value, like a null. You know, if this is null, give it a value sort of thing. That's conditional assign. Looks for those, and those are the sorts of things that may revert. It'll also try and match. Uh, so basically, for each of these candidates that finds, it'll try and see if it will potentially trigger a crash um looking for both data flows or some can or looking for a control flow first can this be reached from the entry point and secondly is there data flow to this point to this variable that it can detect um and make sure there's data flow from that point off to you know does this get dereferenced or something if there's no evidence of a crash it shouldn't be reverted um however being that this is largely done with static analysis, that isn't a perfect setup. They do have also a, what they'll call to avoid uninteresting bugs. They have a bug filter where any injected bug that fails the regression test will get discarded. And that felt a little bit off to me because, as I understand it, a good practice when doing the software development is if you have one of these bugs, if you have a CVE that you're matching, write a regression test to make sure if this ever gets introduced again, it'll fail. And this is saying they're going to ignore any bugs that have a regression test, um, effectively. Which, I mean, fair, but when you're testing the fuzzer, I don't know, that, that does feel a little bit limiting, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, I I won't necessarily dive too far into that, but uh, it's a little strange. I agree. Um, I mean, they I, I kind of need... like skipped over that, but yeah, it's a bit of a limiting factor. Yeah, I'm like they need some sure sort if they of go into the methodology of that. Uh, well, so they do go into um, well, I guess talking about the results here. Uh, they do go into having it like they inject thousands of bugs, and then the fuzzers send find like two hundred of them or something. It was 200 and something. It kind of leads to that point of it feels like a lot of these bugs getting injected. One may not even introduce crashes. Uh, they did that kind of thing to see, like, is it dereference? And they had some checks there, but a lot it seems like a lot of the bugs just weren't being detected by the fuzzers, which could just be the fuzzers weren't good. But also the way it's doing these checks feels like, you know, it's very focused on a really particular type of bug that fuzzers are capable of finding already. You know, the conditional check, so it's not going to find any more complex, um, you know, say races are going to be a bit harder, depending on how a race gets patched. I mean, they're, if they just add locking, for example, I don't think that's going to get picked up by this. But, you know, if they refactor no. things, it may, you know, it depends on how you fix it. But there's a lot of bugs that'll fall through here. This doesn't feel like it's really giving anything new beyond what, like, Lava would have done, where it just injects a conditional. Um, although, in fairness, they specifically try not, or they specifically will not inject any new branches. 
Um, that way there's no instrumentation that can get ripped up purely by what they're doing. But um, it feels to me like you're going to have like similar results where it's just if it would have hit this conditional or not, um, you know, the fuzzer will crash or not based off of that. And I don't know, without having a better ground truth over is the bug actually a crashing bug or how you would detect that bug? It doesn't feel as useful to me as like when we talked about Magma, for example, which introduced, it was basically like taking old bugs, but manually reintroducing them. Um, not as much automation to it. So something I think we kind of skipped over is they do have like a criteria that they aim to meet. Um, and they, they talk about Magma and some of the other um, types of papers we've covered before, like Unifuzz, um, and talk about how those violate the criteria that um, they have set out, which they kind of pulled from another paper, um, which was uh, like they mentioned the the Cleese paper. So yeah, the four criteria they have is um, one, it should involve real world target programs. Two, it should contain realistic and relevant bones. Um, three, it should be triggerable in a way that's clearly identifiable to avoid any issues with uh, deduplication. And finally, it should defend against overfitting, which as I understand it, what they mean by that is when tools use strategies or um, like develop corpus or whatever that can benefit the target programs in the suite, but don't carry over to like other applications very well. Um, so Unifuzz, for example, involves real world, world programs and realistic bones, um, but it has issues with deduplication. Um, Magma, uh, which, you know, we talked about before meets the first three criteria, but it suffers from the overfitting. So the idea here is similar to Unifuzz and Magma um, in the way that it takes real world programs and bugs to evaluate. Um, but they automate the fault injection uh, by doing the the pattern matching. And in that way, um, they can easily add like new programs to the suite to try to avoid like the overfitting um, kind of issue. So that's kind of the goals that they were looking to hit there. Um, they do and, go into a bit of the... They only take a subset of potential vulnerability or potential fixes to get reverted. I think that's kind of an issue here. And I mean, it's a hard problem to solve. It's not like I expected them to be because the identifying all the fixes is just a hard problem. But like, I feel like the way they brought it down, it does catch a lot, but it kind of catches the things that I would expect fuzzers to be able to catch already. Um, and thus, I don't know. I mean, I would just look at coverage as being an almost equivalent metric, which is maybe something I didn't get out of this paper was, you know, how it really compares. I mean, how do you benchmark the benchmarks, I guess? Yeah, so there is one graph I uh, kind of wanted to point to that summarizes their their results. So yeah, it's on page 13 here. Um, so the fuzzers they benchmarked with their, their suite that they came up with were like AFL++, AFL, LibFuzzer, um, FairFuzz, and Eclipser. So they have their graph here that summarizes the individual bugs that were detected over time. Um, AFL++ generally did the best, um, finding more bugs faster than some of the other ones and, you know, just finding more bugs overall, um, with like LibBuzzer and FairFuzz being lower on the chart. Um, so yeah, like their, their main concern here was like, how many bugs can it find and how quickly can it do that? Um, yeah, I do kind of agree that there was a, I think there's a bit of a sample bias where it's, it's going to be able to find those lower hanging fruit type issues more but whenever you have more of the state like issues that are tied more to the state um and like the lifetime type issues yeah it's not really going to help with benchmarking anything like that which is kind of relevant because when you're talking about some of these different fuzzers like afl is a bit more of a like dumb fuzzer like it's, it's coverage guided but it's kind of just throwing data at it and seeing what it can hit when you have these dumber issues I think AFL is going to perform better. But then when you have something like libfuzzer, where you have a little bit more influence over the data, or you can write harnesses that are smarter with it. Um, I mean, you kind of do that with AFL too, I guess. But yeah, like I feel like the differences with the fuzzers don't really shine through with the kind of testing that they're doing. Um, yeah, like, so, it wouldn't like pick I don't up think it's a, a good thing to look at this and just go like, okay, AFL plus plus is the best. Um, I think there's a lot of nuances that are left out with the the study they did. Yeah, like it feels like where basically any sort of new bone class, um, like this will find a lot of the traditional things, uh, just bound, lack of bounce checking, for example, which fuzzers are great at finding. Um, and I do also want to say uh, thank you to 
Alla Rave 96 um, for the Prime sub. Yeah, coming back on topic here. I don't know, like, there, there's validity to this, and that was a problem with Magma where they would revert fixes, but it was very manual. This is trying to do that in an automated fashion. There's validity to that, but I do wonder, like, what is the best way to benchmark fuzzers? Because, yes, like, I do think it should be with real volumes. But when we're talking about real vulns, I think about more complex to hit vulnerabilities, and this is just kind of reverting the simpler vulnerabilities, it feels like. Um, at least that's my feeling on it, I guess. It's a... Uh, it's a hard problem. Like, I don't have an answer to it. I'm glad they're doing the research here and, you know, all of that. I don't want to... don't want to disparage the research being done of... It's also just the fact that they've gone through that and they are detecting the fixes is, is even a valuable thing on its own, even though it's not the benchmarking fuzz case. Like, you could use that just to detect when somebody's trying to, say, patch a bug without giving it a CV or something. Um, like, there there are uses in there, too. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I think this really just comes down to how do you benchmark a fuzzer? And I'm not sure this is it, personally. Like, it just, um, as you're saying there with AFL or Live Fuzzer, you know, they're going to perform pretty well with these sorts of things, uh, just being coverage guided. But how would you compare, say, coverage guided versus some other guidance fuzzer? Um, yeah. You know, depending on what it's trying to do, maybe it starts finding different bug classes that just aren't being covered by these sorts of checks. Um, and that kind of leads into where I mentioned, um, they say here in a 5.2, overall fuzzers found 219 distinct individual bugs during our experiments out of thousands injected, and we don't know how many of those injected can lead to a crash. That's kind of the concern to me, because we don't have a ground truth. We don't have that knowledge of where all the actual bugs are that should be detected to really make that comparison. Yeah. Um... So yeah, I think there are some nuances lost in the study. I think it is cool to be able to take kind of what Magma was doing and add the automation because back when we were talking about Magma, um, you know, the manual labor was a significant uh, concern because it just doesn't scale well. Um, this can scale a bit better. It reminds me a little bit of, uh, you know, going back to the DEF CON talks again. It's kind of funny how much they're tying into this episode. Um, but the talk on the uh, scaling the security researcher to eliminate the OSS vulnerabilities, it kind of shares some similarities with that talk. Um, and for those that weren't around for those DEF CON streams, basically what they were doing there was uh, they were doing like mass uh, code pattern matching to try to find vulnerabilities, particularly in like Java um, for those case studies. And they were doing like mass submission of pull requests. Um, this is a little bit different though. Like this is doing sort of the same uh, pattern matching to try to find the bones, but instead reverting the fixes and rewriting them that way. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of cool. There was a bit of overlap there. Um, I think the like idea is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I think in its current state, it's not really super useful for benchmarking fuzzers. I think there's some other, like some more work that needs to be done. Um, that said, trying to detect some of those deeper, like state tied issues, I don't even know if it would really be doable with this like idea. Um, it just seems like something that's going to be way too difficult to to do in a way that's not going to be introducing a bunch of problems. Yeah, um, I, I honestly, whenever you're doing these kinds of code rewrites and stuff. I, I have no idea how you'd manage to do it with something else. Like, I think they've done a fair job for what they attempted here, you know, in in identifying at a very high level, just additional assign, exact, and abort. Like, just breaking it down into those categories does catch a lot of things. Like, in fairness, that it, like, it's not bad at all. Oh, um, so for, like, all of the negatives I have said here, like, it is a hard problem. And I feel like without solving the other one, it's not as useful, but um, I have no idea how you would do that either. Yeah. It's uh, really to be, easy to criticize, I guess, from my perspective, but... To be fair, in their future work section, they do state, um, like, their second goal for future work is to 
uh, extend their bug patterns and include patterns that don't involve changes to control flow. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what that'll look like and, and they probably don't either. Um, it seems like when you're getting into the deeper analysis beyond just like the simple control flow, you can start running into the state explosion problems you have in static analysis. Um, and like symbolic execution kind of thing. Uh, I can see them running into the same types of challenges. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see if there's any further research on this. I think the idea is cool, but um, yeah, it's just not really that useful as it is right now um, for benchmarking fuzzers. And, you know, like we've always said, when we cover these kinds of topics, benchmarking fuzzing is really damn hard um, because, you know, what aspects do you consider important? Uh, a lot of people focus on the performance, but is that the most important metric? Uh, I mean, not really. Here, they're kind of focusing on the number of bugs it finds, which is an important metric, obviously. Um, but, you know, there's context there, too. So, yeah, it, it's it's good that there's more research getting done in this area. It's always been something that's been lacking with fuzzing is like getting some objective ground truth um, information on which ones do things better than others. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something that's going to be an ongoing problem for a while, uh, and there's going to be a, a lot more research needed into it. But still, I thought the idea um, of it and doing these like automatic fix reversions was a neat idea and something that you could potentially play with for um, testing your fuzzer. I just don't really think it's good for, for comparing fuzzers, really, um, because there's too many nuances that are left out. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that last point there. It's It's interesting as it stands. Not sure it's the best comparison right now. I am reminded of um another paper. We we didn't cover it. I think it came out. I think it might have come out during the summer, or at least I first took notice of during summer. Perhaps it was actually quite old, but it was about detecting CVE fixes and just automated detection of CVE patches. Um, it makes me think. You know, could you apply that towards this as the means of it reintroducing bugs just by taking the CVE patch itself and removing it oh yeah instead of trying to do the more generic patterns yeah yeah that said i don't know what the internals of that cv fixes paper was and how they were doing it exactly um i just remember kind of seeing it and now i'm reminded of it since we're talking about reverting fixes yeah all right uh but yeah like i said I, I think it's a bit of a neat paper um it could be useful in testing your own fuzzing and stuff but yeah um in terms of comparing fuzzers, yeah, I, I just don't really think it's it's that great. All right, so uh, that's all the topics that we have for this episode. Uh, thank you, everyone who tuned in. You can catch the VOD on Twitch immediately or on other platforms like YouTube tomorrow. Uh, we also have previous podcasts up on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more that you can find through Anchor. If you want to join our Discord and follow us on Twitter, links for those are in the chat or down below. Um, and yeah, we will see you guys next week uh, for the podcast, and we'll see you then.